I'm Jerry Hancock with Men in Balance, and we have a very special treat today, an interview with Bob McKillop, head coach of Davidson Basketball. Hey, Bob, how are you? Good morning, Jerry. Wonderful to be with you. Good. I appreciate you doing this for us. So maybe just to catch up, um, how are you doing during all this COVID stuff? Well, you could feel sorry for yourself. You could lament the, what's going on, or you could try to make it a productive and creative time. And <clears throat> we met with our team back in the end of uh, the season, uh, which uh, abruptly ended as we were in Brooklyn getting ready to play LaSalle six hours before game time. They canceled the A-10 tournament, and that uh, was just one of many tournaments that were canceled. And um, we came back that night from Brooklyn and met as a team that evening and then the next day and dismissed our players. And we said to them that the two greatest things they could do during this time period would be to get better at leadership and get better at communicating. Uh, two things that uh, they didn't have to get on a basketball court to, to do or get into a weight room to do, but two things that would reverberate with them becoming better people, better players, and a better team. And uh, that's been our mission since uh, the end of March, and uh, I'm pleased with the progress that we've made. So um, what's going on day to day? I mean, obviously you're coming into the office. Uh, what's going on in terms of recruiting and in terms of access to the court and all of that? Uh, we, we have uh, Zoom meetings with the coaching staff uh, twice a week and multiple phone calls back and forth. With the team, we're going with one Zoom call per week with the entire team. And we're also uh, calls, texts, emails, on a consistent basis uh, multiple times. Each coach has been given a group of players to uh, monitor and interact with, and uh, they've been charged with uh, three guys throughout these last four or five months and uh, maintaining close contact with them, uh, with their parents, and, and trying to just keep us as unified and as uh, in touch with each other as possible. Yeah. So uh, I know you do some international recruiting. Has any of the COVID stuff interfered with that? Uh, you know, probably the greatest disadvantage of uh, the, the virus has been the inability to get into gyms and watch people compete. And of course, that's uh, impossible in, in the world of travel. So uh, the NCAA has now established a dead period, which uh, had been in effect uh, for parts of May and then extended into June and then to July. And now it's effective until September 1. All of the tournaments that occur nationally uh, have been uh, somewhat short-circuited. There are guys that are competing in tournaments. No crowds are at the games. Parents can attend. College coaches cannot. In the international world, uh, certain teams uh, or countries are almost back to full force in terms of their competitive opportunities. So, for example, um, Young Jung Lee has been in Seoul, Korea, and has been playing pickup uh, almost every day since uh, returning home at the end of March. Uh, Sam Menenga in Auckland, New Zealand, has been facing a similar experience. Uh, Luka Brajkovic, who is in... Um, Phil Kirk, Austria, had uh, a period of about a month or six weeks where they could do nothing not, and was very limited. So he went to outdoor playgrounds or in the streets or in his backyard and, and did his workouts that way. And that was similar for David Christensen in, in Aarhus, Denmark. Uh, David Sharapovich, who is in um, Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, had no restrictions whatsoever and played one-on-one, -on -one, five on five, and had access to weight rooms and gyms his entire time. So that was the experience of our players. And I, I believe that that's the experience of our recruits that are international as well. They're having opportunities to play. So had we the luxury to travel, number one, and number two, be given permission by the NCAA to evaluate, we could be doing that in the European marketplace right now or the Asian marketplace, but we aren't doing that because of the restrictions. So what do you know about the upcoming season and, and as far as uh, timing and so forth uh, and the school schedule and all of that, anything? Well, quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, <laughs> I'm amused at the, uh, the culture of today and the number of experts who are paraded in front of us, but yet no one seems to have an answer. And that's understandable. This is uh, uh, an experience that um, we don't have experience with. 
And with that being said, you're having a variety of uh, comments made by doctors, by uh, directors, by leaders, by politicians, relative to what's transpiring and what's going to actually happen. Uh, and I'm sensing that the, the biggest uh, judgment for us will begin this Thursday when Major League Baseball begins again. And then maybe a week later when NBA has the bubble down in Orlando. And then as uh, NFL camps open up at the end of July, and we've already seen the impact of uh, the virus on college football teams who have um, uh, come back together and tested in multiple cases at multiple universities. So I, I think there's a lot of guinea pigs out there right now, laboratories out that are going to determine where we are going as, as a basketball entity, which uh, is still several months away. Are there some plans uh, in place for as far as for keeping the facilities clean and all of that if you do have a season start? Well, at, at this point, uh, it's ironic we're speaking today on Monday, July 20th. It's the first day that you can actually have workouts with your players. And it's limited to one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the facilities have to be scrubbed before the player takes the court. The ball has to be scrubbed. Um, the temperature has to be taken. Uh, there's a very, very thorough a checklist of activities that a player must do before he can actually step on a basketball court. So you can work with that player one-on-one, -on -one, one player per court, uh, and you must be observing uh, the mask, the social distancing, uh, the washing of the hands, the taking of the temperature, and the cleaning up before and after in order to have any kind of workout whatsoever. So the, we will have one-on-one -on -one workouts, one coach, one player, one basket uh, beginning this week. And we have seven current players, most of them, all of them, except for Nelson Bocciatum, our stateside guys. So our six stateside guys and Nelson Bocciatum, who never went home to England at the conclusion of the school year, they will be here getting workouts on a three, four times a week. So I don't want to reveal any secrets necessarily, but anything you can tell us about the upcoming stars for the season, do you think? A little bit too early to, to say anything about who will be starters or even who will be in a rotation. Uh, we're very encouraged by our roster. Although you look at the, uh, the expectations that uh, the media has generated during these past two, three months, and uh, we're not mentioned at all as being a, a formidable foe in the Atlantic 10 this year, uh, but our coaching staff is thrilled with the guys we have on our roster. Uh, the work ethic that they have, the talent that they have, and the cohesiveness that has developed during these past four months. So you had a lot of uh, uh, players from last year who continue, right? I mean, you didn't, you didn't lose a whole lot. Well, we lost John Axel Goodmanson, who was an outstanding four-year leader, player, competitor, uh, just a, a sensational experience and career here at Davidson. Uh, we also lost Keyshawn Pritchett, Luke Frampton, uh, Malcolm Winter, Cal Freundlich, and Pat Casey. So uh, we lost three guys that were non-scholarship players, and we lost three guys that were scholarship players. So uh, we, we've got a few holes to fill. There's no mm. doubt about that. So how are you feeling about the, the folks that are stepping up now? Uh, very encouraged by the leadership of the three seniors, Kellen Grady, Carter Collins, and uh, uh, Bates Jones, uh, encouraged by uh, the veteran players who, by, and I say veteran, those guys who have started or been in starting positions or played starters minutes, very encouraged by them. And of course, the newcomers, I think, are going to be an exciting addition to our program. Um, I got an observation for you that you might never have heard. It's interesting when you're talking to you, your voice is sort of um, low-key and um, I would say subdued. On the court, however, you can make yourself heard all the way down the court. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. Well, I, I, it comes from uh, 47 years of experience and uh, you want to make sure your voice is distinctive and it's loud enough to be heard and it's repetitive because uh, you, you want their attention. Um, and you're, you're leading a group of men and you want them really clearly in line with you and uh, 
communicating loudly is one of the ways we make sure they're in line with what we expect them to do. Yeah. Well, they respond for sure. And, you know, again, from a personal observation, it's just interesting to watch these guys develop. I mean, they start out, um, you know, already pretty competent, but the amazing amount of uh, progress they make is just phenomenal. And I, I attribute that to good coaching and their hard work. You know, player development is one of the foundations of our program. Uh, where they are now and where they hope to be uh, is a process of uh, dreaming, but it's a process. Uh, they dream about having great careers and becoming great players, but then they have to invest themselves with tremendous work. Now, that kind of commitment is across the board on our roster, but also across the board on our coaching staff. And uh, our, our assistant coaches are magnificent in the way they can roll their sleeves up, pull their shorts up, tighten their sneakers, and get out there on the court and demonstrate, and then hold our players accountable for repetition after repetition after repetition. And, and you know, the, the game of basketball is, is a game of rhythm. You have to be in rhythm, but you have to have habits that become instinctive. And those habits are developed from repetition after repetition, uh, much like an actor on a Broadway stage. In order to do a dance step, in order to choreograph uh, a dance routine or a singing routine or a recitation of your lines, you have to have multiple dress rehearsals. It has to be broken down in, in very small, minute parts method teaching in order for it to be eventually put together as a whole. That's what our assistant coaches have done an extraordinary job of, of implementing, but our players have to buy into that process. And thankfully we got guys that have terrific character who are willing to work, they want to be coached and they want to get better. And they step into the gym each day with that as their intent, not to get through a workout, but to get better as a result of a workout. You know, I, I'm um, aware that you spend a lot of time personally with these guys and you coach them not just on the basketball skills, but on life skills and all of that. I was partic particularly impressed when you uh, took the group to Europe last year and uh, and this was not about a basketball. It was about learning about the concentration camps and, and all of that. That's, that's pretty much unheard of in the sports industry. You know, I, I reflect back upon that experience. And, uh, you know, the year before that, we had gone to Pearl Harbor. We had a, a, a tournament in Hawaii at Christmas. And <clears throat> we had one day off. And we took that day to go to Pearl Harbor. And for our guys to see that historical experience of uh, – the, the Arizona and uh, ju just that, uh, I guess, sanctified and holy site that existed there and um, certainly not in their lifetime, but a piece of history. And then they get to go to Auschwitz that following year and um, not read a book about it or not see a movie about it, but actually be there and touch and smell and feel and understand exactly when, what went on. And to see that through the prism, through the narrative, through the eyes of Eva Moses Kaur, who had been one of the Mengele twins and survived, uh, that's an experience of a lifetime. And it was uh, life-changing for all of our guys. So I'm a little bit uh, curious about your thinking behind that. I mean, since this is unusual, what, what thinking process did you go through to decide that this would be really powerful for these guys and help them, help them on the court as well? Well, we, we had some outstanding uh, alumni who were involved in the process and uh, uh, through their wisdom and their generosity uh, said that Davidson's basketball team would be on a stage that might bring light to what went on in the Holocaust because uh, there was a survey made about an understanding of the Holocaust and uh, I want to say 25, 30% of the people knew about it in high school, uh, but 70% didn't know about what it was. And uh, there's a need to keep history alive. And uh, I, I think uh, we're, we're seeing that uh, what we're going through today being historical times, we've got to make sure everyone is aware of that. And not just in our lifetime, because our lifetime is not history. All of lifetime is history. And uh, for our guys to be leaders in that venture in terms of making people aware what happened as they step onto the stage in their lives, in their careers, with their future families, and 
recollect to them what they saw at Auschwitz, I, I think that's a powerful educational process for our guys to uh, take upon themselves and to become leaders, making sure that this is never forgotten. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, again, thrilled that you do this with these guys. I'm curious now about your own family. Uh, Brendan, for example, is he still in Europe? No, Brendan uh, uh, works for the NBA International. Uh, what he does is he sets up camps and academies uh, and, and programs internationally for the NBA. And he lives in Manhattan, 23rd Street and 3rd Avenue with his lovely wife, Kina, uh, also a former D Davidson athlete. And uh, she works for Goldman Sachs. And Brendan is is now on hold because all of the activities and all of the functions and all the events that the NBA has sponsored have been put on hold because of the virus. So he's planning, he's plotting, he's organizing, uh, but he can't implement at this point because of uh, the breaks that were put on by the NBA relative to international travel and international events. Wow, that's gotta be frustrating. Um well, talk a little bit about Matt and how it's been to work with Matt as a uh, father-son kind of combination. Yeah, sometimes uh, I, I feel I could write a book about uh, father-sons in terms of relationships based upon uh, coaching them. And that's really what it's been. Um, you see, we're all coaches. Uh, coach father, coach husband, coach spouse, coach sibling, um, coach uh, colleague. Uh, coach in the community. And uh, I've had the great luxury of, of being in a coaching environment with Matt now, uh, four years as a player, and uh, I'm guessing 11 years, 12 years as an assistant coach. And um, Matt wears Davidson on his heart. And uh, it shows in his face and it shows in his activities and actions and commitment to Davidson. And, and that's a tremendous plus to have. And coaching him, because he is our son, is an experience that uh, can be challenging, uh, but an experience that can be very profitable if you remove the pride factor, you remove the ego factor. And uh, I, I think we've been very good about making sure that doesn't exist, or at least it's curtailed. So he can say things to me that no other assistant coach has ever said to me. Uh, and he can say that without any hesitation. And sometimes a, a guy my age with the experience I've had in the length of my tenure, there might be some hesitancy to say what's on the mind of an assistant coach. Um, Matt doesn't have that hesitation. That, that's incredibly fruitful for our program, uh, personally fruitful for me. And it, it's that kind of interaction, I think that, uh, uh, Matt is very good at understanding how much leeway he has to say what he does say. Well, I would also uh, add to that from the stands. It looks like uh, you both have a lot of respect for each other, and I can see that he is recommending things which you are nodding yes to, and so it just seems like a great relationship. Yeah, you know, he's a, such a competitor, and uh, uh, but he, he doesn't cross that line and understands there's a head coach who makes the decisions and there's an assistant coach who makes the suggestions, but never at all is he hesitant to make a suggestion and shows that kind of respect, understanding that I make the decision. Not to leave out any of the rest of the family, but how is uh, Kathy and how is Karen? Well, uh, Kathy's doing marvelous. She's uh, not just a terrific spouse, but uh, a great mom and an incredibly great grandmother as well. Uh, Karen, our daughter is living in Dallas and her husband, Henry, a, a baseball player class of 97, is the head of the upper school at the Episcopal School of Dallas. So he's dealing with all kinds of issues as you deal with the virus right now in a position of leadership and education. And uh, it's a challenging experience, no doubt. Um, and Karen had worked for McKinsey, uh, the, the great consulting firm, and now she's a mom and she's a terrific one. She's taken a lot of lessons from her own mother and is really uh, uh, translating that into being a terrific mom and spouse at home. I assume you feel like I do being a grandfather is a great experience. <laughs> um, you know, there's great wisdom that God has in making it work this way. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, you get a second shot at it, don't you? I mean, you get the yeah, and, and um, what a feeling to see your own child become a parent, and then to raise their own child, and you to be the connection in that three-way process. Yeah, amazing. Last time we talked, um, we talked about your spiritual life and the evolution of your spiritual life and how you share that uh, pretty openly with your players and, uh, and with the community. Do you want to talk any about uh, how that has evolved over the years? Uh, what, would, what would we see in the young Bob McKillop? Uh, what would we see in the seasoned Bob McKillop? Um, you know, if I had to live my life all over again, I would love more. That perhaps is uh, the biggest regret that I have. And that love wasn't because there was something wrong with my heart, but there was something in the way of my heart. And that something was number one, pride, and number two, time. Uh, the pride mandated that I become the best version of myself that I could become. And at times in doing that, perhaps I didn't act in the kind of way I should have acted. And at other times when invitations and opportunities were made available to me uh, to demonstrate that what was on my heart, uh, I didn't take the time to do it. I was so intent on uh, the quest for excellence and the quest to um, be a success story that uh, that time was then focused upon that prideful adventure and that prideful journey uh, rather than understanding that uh, uh, that's not what this is all about. Uh, what this is all about is, is using the gifts you have uh, to best help those that you interact with on a daily basis. And uh, I, I've learned and tried, and believe me, I'm woefully inefficient, but I've tried and I've learned uh, to try to use each day as best as I can to help people. And uh, I think that's what our mission in life is. Oh, I agree with that. Uh, just, it just occurs to me that uh, having this kind of vulnerability and willingness to talk about your personal life is not exactly something you see a lot of in the sports business. And is, does that present any conflict for you? I mean, it's a macho kind of world out there in the most, for the most part. I, I really believe that um, grace is something that uh, is freely given. And uh, that, that's a, a daily prayer of mine, to have that grace, to understand what the dynamic is. So as I approach each day, each moment, each minute, uh, each moment, each minute, each day gives you an opportunity to use that grace uh, to bring people closer to God. And if, if that's a weakness as judged by the secular world, so be it. I've got the grace to have the confidence that that's the best way that God wants me to act. And I have no hesitation whatsoever to uh, wear that on my face, in my words, in my actions. I'm woefully inept at doing that because we're, I'm a sinner. And uh, I, I've sinned in every capacity that I've uh, lived in, whether it's uh, as a young son, whether it was as a competitor in a sport, whether it was as a teacher in a classroom, uh, a spouse, a coach, uh, a father, a grandfather. Uh, that's the nature of our world. And it's only through grace that I've been able to understand that and, and continue to work my way in the process of journeying towards uh, this destination, which uh, uh, God points us to. So um, you've talked a little bit about the difference between the young Bob McKellop and the older Bob McKellop. What, would, what advice do you want to give to your sons in this regard? I mean, do you feel like they are, they are aware? Of, I'm sure they're aware of your role model, but are they aware of the importance of this in their life? I have no hesitation to speak with them, not just my sons, but our family. Uh, no hesitation to speak with my quote unquote sons who play basketball for us. And I've got over a hundred of them now. Uh, I, I have that confidence because I've been given that grace. And, and the advice I think most frequently that I share with them is the two greatest gifts that God has given to me, to us, 
are the gift of time and the gift of love. Those are also the two gifts that he wants us most to give back to him. Give God time, give God love. But he also wants us to give those gifts to everyone we come into contact with. And that is such a simplistic way of looking at things, but I think it's one of the most powerful and effective ways of uh, understanding, accepting, and fulfilling your mission in life, time and love. Use those gifts and use those gifts wisely. Mm. Wow, what a powerful message. Well, Bob, I've always known you to be a man of integrity. I, I see that in, your, uh, in every uh, exhibit of your public life and private life and everything. I so appreciate your taking the time to talk to us today. This has been wonderful and hope we can do this again pretty soon. Jerry, I always welcome a chance to, to speak with you and to share the message that you delivered to so many fine people and uh, continue this valuable ministry. And uh, I rejoice in it. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Bob. I'm Jerry Hancock for Men in Balance.